Welcome to The Foundry, where leaders are forged daily. Each week we investigate themes of leadership, entrepreneurship, and mindset with some of the greatest minds in real estate. And now, the data scientist of real estate, George Roberts. Welcome back, entrepreneurs. Today, we'll have the opportunity to meet Vesi Kapoyan, a woman who left Bulgaria with two suitcases and a lot of hope. It was in her new home in the U.S. where she founded DBA Capital Group, a company that focuses on helping passive investors dream, believe, and achieve. Welcome to the show, Vesi. Thank you so much, George. It's a pleasure to be here. Great, and it's a pleasure to have you on. Uh, there's so much that we could talk about today. I know we're definitely going to talk about your company. I love what's behind the name. I think that's beautiful. But maybe we just jump right into underwriting. I know this is something that you're very skilled at. It's one of the things that you use to get yourself into deals. Tell us, what are you doing differently in 2023? That's a great question. And when people ask me about underwriting, I always like to describe it as an art, an art and a science. And the art part of it is uh, the one that requires adjustments based on the market, submarket, or market conditions, which is what we're going through right now in 2023, where we're seeing continuously rising interest rates, still higher costs for payroll, materials, and such et cetera, et cetera. So there are a few things that we are doing as we evaluate property to adjust our underwriting. We're, uh, first of all, being more conservative uh, as far as rent growth is concerned, uh, returning really to more normalized historical levels of 3% or so. And again, that's very market specific. Increasing the vacancy factors as, a proper, as, as appropriate accounting for some interim um, vacancy increases that we, we are seeing in, in the market and um, looking at the expense side of the equation, uh, specifically in my markets, insurance expenses have gone through the roof. And of course, nobody has a crystal ball, but we are checking with insurance brokers multiple times throughout the deal diligence process because those rates are rapidly evolving. And then factoring in maybe a slightly higher year over year increase so we can minimize surprises down the road. Of course, typical adjustments for taxes, payroll, uh, which we see increasing rapidly. On the debt side, uh, the uh, there have been a lot of constraints. One uh, cost of capital has gone up by virtue of the higher interest rates. And, and secondly, the lenders are really underwriting, right? Based on actuals, based on cash flow, and sizing those loans to meet those debt service requirements. So um, LTVs have decreased, which in turn uh, adversely impacts returns, but we have to account for that. Looking at more medium term horizon on the exit and, and fixed rate uh, debt um, to weather that turmoil or, or uncertainty in the market in the short run. And last but not least, uh, looking at the cap rate reversion and building an additional buffer there, um, because again, interest rates are continuing to rise. And I think over time that will uh, continue to put pressure on, on cap rates to reverse to a more normalized level. So effectively um, adjusting all aspects of the, of the analysis, rent, expenses, cap rates, debt terms, and, and definitely reserves uh, remaining very conservative on on that front and making sure we have at least six months of operating expenses, debt service, and for any CapEx improvements that we're planning to make, which for us typically revolve around more stable value add activities versus heavy repositioning, making sure we're including adequate buffers so we can avoid surprises down the road for other unforeseen cost um, increases. Yeah, well, that is a great list. And I'm really glad that you put insurance on that list because I also invest in Florida. I know Florida and Texas are two states in particular that have seen some major increases in insurance premiums, although it's going on across the country. And I believe you mentioned that you've seen deals even in progress that have 
you had to put a hundred extra hundred dollars mm -hmm. for the insurance because the premiums went up. Just like you said, you've got to keep in touch with that broker, not just the loan broker, but your insurance broker right. too. Right. Yeah. It's very, it's evolving rapidly. And again, nobody has a crystal ball. I think we're still, we haven't even started to see some of the major reassessments. So there are probably even more cost increases coming down the, the pipe. So again, nobody knows where things would settle down or stabilize. And that's why better to be more conservative and account for maybe a larger year over year increases and, and build that buffer versus having to walk away from a great property that you found and that worked up until those numbers evolved. Right. And I just saw some statistics on reinsurance. I believe it was in Florida. And the number is just shocking how much the reinsurance is going up. Well, if, if you think that doesn't impact our insurance premiums, oh yes, think again. Absolutely. And unfortunately, it's impacting uh, properties across the state, both in the residential space and the commercial space. So I can't even imagine unless you have a brand new home or recently rebuilt home in, in Florida, homeowners will be saddled with those unpleasant surprises as the year evolves. Yeah. Wow. Well, still on the underwriting front, I'd like to ask you, what do you think is the biggest mistake that people are making in underwriting these days? And that's a hard one because I always like to advise people fall in love with the numbers and not the deal. But I think once you've seen a property, that's uh, very difficult to do. But I think remaining objective, validating your numbers with third parties, such as validating expenses, pro forma rents with the property manager that you will be working with. We talked about the insurance, same thing with the lender. Even as you're underwriting, build some buffer because I personally believe we're not quite done with the rate increases just yet. And so it's not, it wouldn't be surprising if those rates change between your um, LOI acceptance date and closing date. Um, so building in those buffers would be important to minimize um, those surprises. But yeah, namely validating with third parties because Prior experience is helpful, but in this right. fast evolving market, you need those additional control prongs. Right. And taxes too, of course, valuations have mm -hmm. gone up and uh, the government may be slow, but not stupid. And they're catching up and they will be increasing taxes in many, many cases. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then especially in my markets, there's been a lot of talk around rent control and, and rent caps. So rent control is illegal in Florida, at least it has been since uh, in the 1970s. But um, there's nothing that says it won't come back. And Orange County in Orlando almost got it passed. Now, again, it was the decision was appealed because it's illegal in the state to implement that. But only time will tell if those specific regulations will come back. So again, why is that important? I, we can't control government, can't control politics, but you take that data, piece of data and information, and you make sure that you have more realistic current growth assumptions or projections as you're, as you're looking to, to create that business case. Yeah. Well, well you did mention rent control, the... Swedish economist Asar Lindbeck famously said that there's nothing short of aerial bombardment to destroy an area than rent control. So, wow. I mean, I'm sure that as, as a building owner, as a landlord, as somebody who provides housing for people, you mm -hmm. might have some strong opinions about that. Anything you can say out there to people who may be sort of newer and don't really understand what rent control is going to do to an area, what would you say? I would say do your diligence and make sure you understand both sides of the equations because there's no free lunch, right? There's always a cost to any business decision. And for example, as a tenant who may be in favor of rent control and more limited annual increases, um, you also think have to think about the costs that it takes for the uh, landlord to operate that property, not only maintaining a proper insurance, which we already talked, not only about paying Uncle Sam and the property taxes, but there is also a lot of pair maintenance, just day-to-day -day operating expenses that go into running a property and creating a nice community for the tenants there. 
Um, so those decisions to minimize the top line growth are definitely impacting how landlords will think about the expense side of the equation so they can continue to run on those properties in a profitable manner. Again, businesses and landlords uh, don't operate as a nonprofit, right? <laughs> so there is cost to, to some of those decisions. And for people who are in favor of that, maybe they should come walk around some of the rent controlled areas and properties in LA to get an idea of what some of those consequences may be. A very wise and subtle answer. Let's go back to underwriting. What is your favorite underwriting metric to follow? I personally like cash on cash return um, because at the end of the day, that's the money that people take to the bank relative to the amount that they are investing. It's uh, very applicable for joint ventures. I know it could get maybe slightly distorted for um, syndications, which are usually short to medium term hold anywhere from three to seven years. So for syndications, I also like to look at IRR, which factors in the time value of money and particularly the returns and the gain um, that you make at the time of sale. Uh, but if I had to pick only one, I would say <laughs> cash on okay. cash. Return. Do you have a second favorite, like break even ratio? Um, when analyzing deals, absolutely. That's mm -hmm. one of the things I look at. <clears throat> Break even uh, yield on cost as well. I know a lot of times people talk about cap rates, but it's helpful to have the big picture and, and capture everything. So, yes, absolutely. Great. Well, continuing with underwriting, I know that you are helping other teams with underwriting. And what's behind the question here is I like to connect people. So, I'd like to figure out who you'd like to connect with. And if people want to reach out to you, what do they need to do to connect with you? So, if you're one of those groups, that thinks, you know, I need an underwriting expert, maybe I should call Vessi. What, what should they do to have their ducks in a row before they reach out to you? First of all, um, have the basic information so I can be helpful. And, and that's usually the OM, T12 and rent roll. That's what I would need to help evaluate the deal. If they actually have done the analysis already, that's even more helpful because then I can be more expedient and more efficient in my review. Those will be the basic information. We would usually talk about timelines up front. I very responsive and like to set expectations so people are not waiting, sitting around waiting for an answer. Um, so that won't be the case with me. But having that information and being clear on how urgent is the request so we can make sure our timing aligns. Great. Outstanding. And I understand that although you are focused on Orlando, Tampa, and Jacksonville, you have uh, taken deals outside of that area. For example, one, I think you, you were doing the underwriting for, you ended up in a deal in Georgia. So mm -hmm. uh, are there any geographies that you wouldn't consider? Does it have to be close to Florida? Um, it doesn't have to be close to Florida. I've underwritten deals in other states and Midwest, other places in the South, like Texas, et cetera. Of course, if it's in Florida, I'm a little bit more familiar with the various counties and restrictions. If it's outside of Florida, I may require just additional time, particularly when doing diligence around the, some of the key items that we discussed, insurance, taxes, because those could be uh, vastly different and can frankly make a big difference in, in how you approach the analysis. Great. And now I'm from the Midwest, I'm from Michigan, and I've noticed these markets cycle over time. A lot of people talked about the Sun Belt. Like two years ago, all I heard about was the Sun Belt. I heard maybe just a few people talking about places like Cincinnati. But now I hear so many people talking about markets like Cincinnati, places like uh, Kentucky, Eastern Tennessee. These are some of my favorite markets. Are you seeing your favorite market cycle as market conditions change? And walk us through that. What's driving your choices for the best markets to invest in these days? Mm -hmm. In my case, I'm still continuing to pursue deals in Florida and I would say Tennessee and, and Georgia. Why and what is driving my decision? The fundamentals for those remain very strong and consistent. And personally, I would like to continue to maintain focus versus jumping around from one place to another or even 
one asset class to another. So at this stage, I'm choosing to focus on multifamily as an asset class and then Florida, Tennessee, Georgia, as far as location. That is not to say that there are no good markets, other good markets out there. If I was to provide support, for example, to a syndication team or, or, or a deal team, um, I would definitely want to do that initial diligence and make sure the market and sub-market meets uh, my own criteria, which typically for market revolve around population growth, quality job growth, income growth, and then sub-markets, median household income, crime levels, poverty rates. Um, those would be a few of the things I would look at um, before diving into. But at least in the short run, I'm choosing to stay focused um, for those days that I mentioned. Great. And I love some of those markets, particularly Tennessee, great reasoning and a lot of good metrics to look out for. But I want to make sure that you have an opportunity to meet the, the people you're looking for. So is there any group of people that you are trying to meet here? Maybe deal finders, obviously, as an underwriter, that's got to be a very valuable thing. Absolutely. Yes, I'm focused on finding deals, analyzing deals. I'm so really happy to connect with uh, people who are interested in joining on those deals as passive investors and mm -hmm. capital partners. And I've partnered with many before, look forward to creating new relationships and, and building new connections. And I'm very big on educating, especially passive investors who may not be doing this day in and day out. I'm so always happy and, and available to schedule a call and answer questions and, and really focus on that initial education experience, which I think is key in making a prudent investment decisions down the road. Yes, agreed. And that's something I like to do too, as well. It's a very difficult thing to do to wire, say, $50,000 to somebody that you might have only met through the internet. So very helpful. If you're out there as a passive investor and you wonder, what is it like? Is it, is it frightening? Well, not too bad, right? Because you just reach out to somebody like Fessy and she's going to walk you through, help you understand the process and why this makes sense. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then I invest passively as well, so I can definitely relate to the process and some of the questions that were going through my mind as I was evaluating um, those opportunities. Right. Well, let's talk about out-of-state investing. First of all, you are currently in, residing in Southern California. I believe you've been there for many, many years, mm -hmm. but you made uh, the decision that you've described previously as being nerve-wracking mm -hmm. of deciding to to invest not in California, but out of state, other side of the continent, in fact. <laughs> right, right. I think uh, I fell under that initial bias, right? You're told you don't invest anywhere more than, what was it, five miles or driving right. distance, right, within your own um, home. And and it took a lot of strength to overcome that. But financially, mm -hmm. it just made more sense for me to look out of state based on my own investment criteria at the time, which are in, in, were and still are cash flow. Uh, and beyond that, coupled with the regulatory environment, which I didn't want, or at least I wanted to minimize the impact of exogenous events impacting my business plan. So focused on more uh, landlord friendly <clears throat> locations. Yeah. Yeah. And a great decision, of course, when you're in multifamily, it makes a lot more sense to invest out of state. A lot harder to do that if you have single family homes. Absolutely. And I think, uh, I guess at the end of the day, you can be successful or, or figure out how to be successful in any market. But in my case, especially as someone who started at the time, very first real estate investment, I decided to do my best to minimize whatever risks were present at the time. And that's what drove my decision. That is not to say you cannot be successful in California, but I guess um, maybe that's for people with different business and investment objectives. Makes sense. One of the things that I see driving economics throughout the world right now is this distrust of the stock market. You have places like China where this is extraordinarily strong. You see people literally speculating in these ghost cities. And it's really kind of frightening for me to mm -hmm. see. Over here, it seems the opposite. We have all these blue sky laws. We have an SEC. And people are very confident in investing in the stock market, perhaps maybe a little too much. 
Can you tell us about your experiences growing up in Bulgaria and how that helped to influence you as an investor? Yes. In my case, I didn't necessarily have the luxury of, of being exposed to the stock market. When I was <clears throat> growing up, I, I grew up behind the Iron Curtain. And at the time, really, when people talked about investments, they talked about investing in hard assets. So one could argue that was probably my very first exposure to real estate. Mm -hmm. And at the time when people talked about investments, they would typically refer to their buying their first home, maybe a second home passing it on from generation to generation, not necessarily looking for cash flowing properties and possibly investing in some gold, silver, right in the form of jewelry and, and, and such. So it wasn't really until I arrived to the US uh, back in 1998 that I discovered the stock market and the popularity of it. Uh, never quite warmed up to it. And um I did follow the traditional path and getting the 401k and, and all that, uh, but it very much felt to me like a Zeno in a way <laughs> and very volatile as well. So I eventually made the decision to um, start diversifying and tr gradually transition most of my investments into real estate and, and other commercial assets. So one of the most important things in optimizing your asset is getting the right property manager. Do you have any tips for us? How do you interview your property manager? What questions do you ask? What are you looking for? Yes. So those initial conversations are key. And, and one thing I've learned from experience is that very often the initial people that you will connect with are the business development officers that may or may not necessarily end up running the property. So I would definitely advise people as you start having those conversations, make sure that at least in the early stages, you, you meet either with the owner of that property management firm um, or eventually the property manager who will be handling your business. So you can hear directly from them how they actually run the property. It's a discovery process and, and oftentimes there are multiple conversations that are happening where they're interviewing you as a potential mm -hmm. client, right? To figure yes. out if you're the right fit, but you're also interviewing them to make sure that their management philosophy and practices align with yours. In my case, I, I, I am very involved in the management. I'd like to be involved, um, of course, not only for my own investments, but the investments that I manage for my passive investors. So I, I tend to ask a lot of questions, but I, I think that's appropriate. And it's important for me to find a partner who is comfortable with having that open communication channel and frequent communication channel, but not all firms are made equal. So if you, in my case, just as an example, if I sense in the beginning that that would be a, a problem, then that would be a, a red flag, right? To maybe part, part ways and move on um, to the next one. But you definitely want to understand their experience level, the types of assets they manage and whether or not they're consistent with the asset that you will be purchasing or and looking to purchase, how do they manage delinquencies? What is the lease up process? What is their reporting? What, what is their communication style? How are they advertising? Do they have a business plan or will they prepare a marketing plan for you? These are just a few questions to ask and I can go on and on, but it's important to have those initial conversations so you don't have surprises or, or misunderstandings down the road. Right, having a complimentary philosophy and having experience managing the type of asset you have, that's very important. I'm glad you mentioned that because a great property management company for a class C may not be the property management company you'd want to use for class A. Are you looking for section eight tenants? What, you know, what are you comfortable with? Every, I mean, some property management companies, they don't like pets. Other companies love them, right? Because mm -hmm. they'll mm -hmm. actually take the, the pet fee or the pet rent. Right. Right. Yeah. Read your contract too. You got to make sure right. you understand what you're signing. Absolutely. But yeah. It's, it's hugely important. Don't just go with a big name or because it worked for your friend. You definitely want to make sure that your assets and their business plan fits your vision. Exactly. Yes. And like you said, your friend, right, maybe may have a thousand properties with them and you're maybe coming in with 50 units. So like the level of attention also may be different and maybe 
so these are also things to consider and and at the end of the day it's it's business right if if you sense that things are not working out and if they're not delivering at least the key item or the must haves then it's it's okay to part ways and and maybe partner with someone who who is more aligned with what you're looking to accomplish and, and how you operate well, let's move on to mindset. I love the name of your company. So we made reference to it at the beginning. So it's dream, believe and achieve. So tell us what that means for you and how that applies to how you approach your business. Thank you for, for asking. Yes, I. there was a lot of thought that was put behind um, that name. And so dream stands for being very clear on, on what your goals are, where you're headed, having a vision. Uh, believe is believing in yourself, knowing that making those dreams a reality is possible and surrounding yourself with the right individuals who positive like-minded individuals who will help you get there and achieve stands for action. None, none of it matters if you don't take action, even if it's a small, that very first small step that you take but it's important to take action and be consistent and persistent. And over time, you'll get closer to making those dreams a reality. So for me, it's all of that is about creating or in, enabling others to find their personal freedom and, and realizing those dreams, those goals, and using or applying, if you will, real estate as a, one vehicle to get there. That's great. I know that you've listed as three of your key personal characteristics that you are resilient, positive, and organized. Yes, I think that describes me very well. Okay, perfect. So nothing to add? Um, probably spiritual would be the okay. other one I would add. And I think that's the underlying, the source of my strengths during good times and bad times and, and, and how it shapes those resilient, uh, positive, the characteristics that you shared. Okay, great. Yeah, obviously feeds the other three. Well, uh, let's see. What about some of your resources? So I know you're very focused on educating people and you mentioned one-on-one. -on -one. So if you're a mm -hmm. limited partner, or you're looking to become a limited partner, or you like to invest, you can call up Vessi, but you also have a digital book, The Busy Professionals Quick Guide to Investing in Multifamily. Yes, I actually recently launched that, and it's designed to cover key concepts and important topics uh, that I think are relevant for passive investors, uh, while also keeping in mind that uh, they are busy professionals and may not have necessarily the, the time. Um, each chapter is designed to stand on its own and really be a quick three to five minute read and, and serve as a reference guide. But what really inspired that is my desire to make investors more empowered and more educated. Um, very often, or, or one of the mistakes I often see people make is not necessarily doing enough diligence on the market operator or the deal and mostly falling in love with the returns that are presented. But we talked briefly about right underwriting. We talked about vetting markets. There's a little bit more science that goes into that. So at a minimum, knowing what questions to ask of the operator is important to ensure they're making those prudent investment decisions and positioning themselves for success. And so if listeners would like to read that book, what's the best way to find it? The easiest way is through my site, www.dbacapitalgroup.com. And it's under the insights uh, folder uh, or insights tab. Um, they can also email me directly. My email is on, on the website and, and mentioned that they um, heard about it at the Foundry. And I'm also happy to send them that link directly. Outstanding. And if you happen to be driving right now, don't drive off the road. We're going to put that in the show notes. So you also have very famously balanced your W-2 and your growing syndication business. So I believe that you have been in syndication since 2018. Is that correct? Uh, in real estate since 2017, syndication since 2022. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
So what are your secrets? So your day job is, I understand you are, your W-2 is that you are a loan broker, correct? Commercial lender. So I I lend directly. I don't specialize in real estate today. At one point of time, I did. Um, Today, I focus on financing complex multinational companies and I do business loans. So a very helpful experience that I have been able to apply as I underwrite and evaluate deals as I build my real estate portfolio on, on the side as well. Well, one of your key characteristics being organized, I'm sure that helps you with the time management of having so much to juggle. It definitely does, um, although I'm I'm an avid learner, so that's probably an, another word that describes me. And there are two books that have been really helpful in terms of getting helping me organize better. Um, one is the the one thing, and the high performance book. So the one thing and I'm blanking now on the author. Um, Is it Howard Marks? Um, no, I apologize. Okay. Anyway, well, I don't know if his it. book might be the most yeah. important thing, but yeah. uh, but Howard Marks. Is it the one that ends every chapter with the most important thing? Is yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yes, I think that's yes. Howard Marks. Yeah, okay. great book. Yes, and then the high performance book by Del Denny. So those have been very helpful in terms of setting goals, daily objectives, focusing on the needle mover, and then two secondary objectives. I follow that religiously, and it's been very helpful, both with handling projects at my W-2 job, as well as the real estate portfolio. All right. Well, I always have to ask something a little off the wall. So if you could have a billboard, what would it say? I would say positively impacting people. All right. Okay. All right. All right. Well, how about this? I'd like to uh, head into the rapid fire section of the interview. I call this the seven. Okay. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right. Okay. All right. If you could be known for only one thing, what would it be? I think that goes along with the billboard that's namely positively impacting and helping people. Uh, that's ultimately how I think you leave a legacy in this world and something I'm passionate about. What's the greatest lesson you've learned as an entrepreneur? You have to show up 100% every day. A lot of times people see the success and glamour, but there's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears that goes behind the scenes. Not everything goes perfectly. You're learning and growing every day. But even on those tough days, the best you can do is extract the lesson and and move forward. Lick your wounds and move forward. Just keep going and and be present 100% every day. What personal characteristic has been most pivotal to your success? I would say resilient, which has been fueled by my faith. All right. Okay. So now time for a truly random question. Okay. Just tell me when to stop cutting the deck. All right. Let's do it now. All right. (laughs) Okay. This is one I've never asked on the air before. What are your favorite apps? Oh, that's a great one. I like Zoom a lot. <laughs> Definitely helps connect with people. Calendly helps me get organized. And, and my CRM HubSpot definitely keeps me, helps keep all the various projects uh, going. So I, I know I said three, but those are the first that came to mind. Okay, great. Any phone apps that you use? Any other phone apps outside of Google Maps? <laughs> that's one. Of course, the the three that I mentioned that are also on my phone and, and my calendar, that's just, just pivotal. <laughs> to all right, I love it. Great. All, you're all business. Could you name <laughs> a book that's helped to forge you as a leader and as an entrepreneur and why? I read, I think it was last year, The Next Five Moves by Patrick Pet David. And it really resonated with me because it, it covered really, in my view, from A to Z, the entrepreneurship path, the path as a leader, 
building and creating the right systems, processes, being able to let go, start delegating, training and empowering people. There are just a lot of golden nuggets that I think are very relevant to anyone looking to take the entrepreneurial journey. And so it resonated very well with me. Describe a failure or a misstep and what it taught you. That actually reminds me of the deals that we closed last year. And uh, namely, we actually, um, the first deal and the second deal came shortly um, one after another. And both got on their LOI around March of last year, which is unfortunately when the Fed started raising rates. And we... Uh, we were faced with a really tough situation where our lender simply walked away on us saying we're shutting down our process and, and, and good luck. I think the mistake I made there is I just assumed other lenders operate in a manner that I do. Um, and we were kind of left, left standing at the altar with no advance notice. Um, I had been working with that particular lender for some time and so did some of my partners. He had been very responsive when we were vetting and socializing term sheets. So from my perspective, it was the right thing to do and grant him the business if or when we found a deal. I think the mistake I did was not building multiple lender relationship and have since adjusted that process. I, I know not uh, some brokers don't like that, uh, but I think it's necessary because if something similar was to happen in the future, at least you have at least two other options to lean on and not be um, stuck <laughs> in, in the 11th hour. Yes. Having more than one lender, that's definitely something good going into your closing. Give us a quote to help forge our listeners as leaders and entrepreneurs. The one that comes to mind is success is not final, failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that matters by Churchill. And how can our listeners reach out to you? The easiest way to connect with me is through my site, www.dbacapitalgroup.com. Again, D for dream, B, believe, A, achieve. My phone number, email, link to my personal calendar are there. And I'm always happy to connect with fellow investors and have further conversations. Okay, outstanding. Thank you so much, Vesti Kapuyan, for taking the time to share your knowledge and experience with our audience. Thank you so much, George. I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank <laughs> you.